Good late afternoon. Good evening to everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Joshua Toplitsky. Uh, I have the honor of being the Joseph Meyerhoff Chair in Modern Jewish History and the Director of the Jewish Studies Program here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, this evening, it's my special joy to welcome you to the 28th annual Patricia Braun Silvers and David Silvers Visiting Scholars Program. Uh, more than a quarter of a century ago, Patty and David Silvers, who are both Penn alumni, established this visiting program in order to bring to campus, in person and virtually this evening, a distinguished scholar in the field of Jewish studies to share the fruits of their research and thinking with the Penn community and beyond. The Silvers Lecture is one that aims to shed light on contemporary concerns and issues from the vantage point of scholarly excellence. And there can hardly be a more fitting topic this year when the attention of so many of us and the world is on the Israel-Hamas war to take historical stock of the founding moment and to learn about how the birth of Israel was perceived in the wider world. I'm especially glad to be able to welcome on Zoom portion both Patty and David Silvers this evening. Our speaker for the evening, Professor Penslar, will speak for approximately 45 minutes, and then uh, Professor Penslar will be happy to entertain questions through the use of the Q&A box, and we'll be monitoring that, and I welcome people to enter their questions along the way, and we'll select from some of them and read them aloud. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Derek Penslar, who is the William Lee Frost Professor of Jewish History at Harvard University. He's the Director of Undergraduate Studies within the department, as well as directing their Center for Jewish Studies. Professor Penslar is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the American Academy for Jewish Research, and is an Honorary Fellow of St. Anne's College, the University of Oxford. Professor Penslar is the author of many acclaimed books, his works have engaged with a variety of approaches and methods, including the history of science and technology in his first work, Zionism and Technocracy, economic history in his book, Shylock's Children, Economics and Jewish Identity in Modern Europe, military history, his book, Jews and the Military, a history was published in 2013, biography, Theodore Herzl, The Charismatic Leader, published in 2020, and the most recent uh, contribution to a history of emotions in Jewish life in his book, Zionism, An Emotional State. And that's not even mentioning his edited volumes and numerous articles, which would take up uh, too much time and would rob us of hearing Professor Penslar's words. As we shall soon discover together, Professor Penslar takes a comparative and transnational approach to modern Jewish history. His teaching likewise reflects these interests in integrating Jewish history into global contexts. And his teaching interests range widely from modern Jewish history to the history of Zionism in Israel, courses on nationalism, military history, and the history of emotions. Tonight, we have the pleasure of listening to Professor Penslar and Professor Penslar, it is my pleasure to turn the stage over to you. Thank you very much. I hope that everybody can hear me okay. Um, I am now going to share my screen. It should be, um, I assume that you can see it, but I don't know. Can someone tell me if you can see the unlaunched presentation? Not just yet. Okay, so I need to go back to square one. It shouldn't take very long. There it is. Just it takes a little bit with an Apple computer, a little bit of massaging. You should see it. How about now? Excellent. Thank you. It looks great. Okay. Okay. So let's get started. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Joshua, for the um, invitation. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person, but my teaching schedule this term and everything else going on keeps me at Harvard pretty much all the time. So it's a little hard to get away. Uh, but I'm, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk with you about um, a, a new book project that I'm, I've am i started. Um, and it is uh, about the global history of the 1948 Arab-Israeli war. Um, what I mean by that is I'm trying to put the struggle for Palestine between 1947 and 1949 in a global context in order to both decenter and recenter the war. Uh, the fact is Palestine was a fairly minor player in the early years of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. Its, its scope paled in comparison with contemporary crises such as the partition of the subcontinent, uh, that is India, uh, the Chinese Civil War, and uh, and of course the uh, Cold War in Central Europe. On the other hand, the 1948 war traumatized the Middle East and it transformed it 
And for the emerging non-aligned world, or the world that would of states that would become independent in the era of decolonization in the 1950s, 1960s, the plight of the Palestinians came to symbolize a global struggle uh, between Western colonizers and uh, what Franz Fanon would call the wretched of the earth. The internationalization of Palestine is something I really want to talk about tonight. That is the process by which countries all over the world, politicians, uh, makers of public opinion all over the world become interested in what's happening in the area that is commonly referred to in the world as Palestine. Uh, it's obviously rooted in religious significance, religious significance for Christians, uh, for Muslims and, and Jews alike. Over the course of the 19th century, Palestine had become an object of great power uh, competition with Christian institutions, uh, protected holders of European citizenship, served European political and economic interests. So you could be a, you know, a Russian subject, but uh, living in Palestine, but under Russian protection or German protection or English protection or, or so on. Um, but the pace of internationalization or globalization of Palestine increased quite quickly after World War I with the creation of the League of Nations. And Britain assumes control of Palestine as a League of Nations mandate. So first of all, there is the notion of international sanction for British rule, and there is a permanent mandates commission whose job is to supervise essentially what Britain and France are doing with their... Um, uh, their mandates uh, throughout the world. But the fact is that the Permanent Mandates Commission was pretty small. Uh, that is, the members were mainly uh, colonial powers, including Japan. And, and in general, they favored the Zionist cause. There, there was another kind of internationalization in the interwar period in which Zionist groups throughout the world tried to mobilize public opinion and, and get diplomatic support for Zionism. And the same thing happened in the Arab and Islamic world. So, for example, the Mufti of Jerusalem, uh, Mohammed Amin al-Husseini, uh, established ties with the Khalifat movement in India, that is the movement to restore the caliphate. And in 1931, he and the Indian Muslim leader, uh, Shakal Ali, convened a World Islamic Congress in Jerusalem that strengthened perceptions of Palestine as not only a pan-Arab concern, but also a pan-Islamic one. And we'll get to that later on in my remarks about how the Palestine issue becomes a pan-Islamic issue uh, in, in, very much in 1948 and not merely an Arab or Middle Eastern issue. Uh, nonetheless, despite all of this background, I think that the referral by Britain of the Palestine issue to the United Nations in early 1947 marked a, a major leap forward in the process of uh, globalization of the Palestine issue. The fact is that as in the League of Nations in the UN, it's one country, one vote. And it can be a small country, it can be a big country, they all have one vote. And although large uh, great powers like the United States and the Soviet Union certainly try to pressure smaller countries, at the end of the day, and we'll see this in just a few minutes, uh, the smaller countries could act quite independently. But what they all shared in common between 1947 and 49, they all had to somehow make a decision about the Palestine issue. They had to formulate policy. Uh, they couldn't get away from it. And so um, Palestine became the responsibility of the UN as a whole. And on top of that, unlike many other crises of the early Cold War period, the Palestine issue definitely had a greater resonance in public opinion than many other uh, problems of the time. So, um, I'll acknowledge that I'm hardly the first person to write a book about the struggle for Palestine in the late 1940s. There's thousands of books about this subject. I think what's missing is twofold. What, one thing that's missing is a focus on, again, a, a global approach as opposed to mainly focusing on the great powers. There's a zillion books about the United States and the Palestine issue, the Soviet Union and the Palestine issue, and the United Kingdom and Palestine. What I'm trying to do in my book, and you'll see a bit of this now, is to really look at um, a much larger uh, group of actors. And also, we need to go beyond uh, the elite actors and try to delve down into public opinion, which admittedly is, is challenging. And as I've told my students, this is not a book that you should try to write when you're not yet tenured. Uh, this is a book that I can undertake now, later in my career, when I have the time to uh, be adventurous and to take some risks. And you'll see, uh, I guess you'll be the judges this evening, whether the risks have panned out or not. 
So I'm going to do two things tonight. First, I'll talk a bit about the United Nations in this global context, and then I'll move on to talk about public opinion uh, during the war. So the first thing I want to do is want to see if I can move my slides. Here we go. So the globalization of Palestine. Where is Palestine? Oh, there it is. Now let's move on. Okay. Uh, beyond the great powers, Palestine of the United Nations. Here we go. Whoops. Stay there. Okay. We have to understand that what was called the Palestine question, this was a term used uh, in the United Nations uh, literature of the time, was one of many questions or problems that United Nations uh, uh, literature referred to. In fact, if you look at the UN yearbooks from 1947, 48, 49, they have a long list of questions, you know, the Ukraine question, the Spanish question. And there were two questions in particular that I think paralleled and in some ways throw light on the Palestine question. One was the Greek question. This referred to the Greek Civil War uh, that began in 1946. So this was guerrilla warfare against the Greek regime by Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Albania, but also civil strife within, within Greece. Now, Greek guerrillas um, declared a provisional government, and there wasn't much the UN could do because the UN isn't supposed to intervene in uh, inside sovereign states, although in the early 2000s, it began to change that view. So it really took Stalin to end this war by breaking with Tito, uh, dampening Tito's taste for adventure, getting the Yugoslavians out of support for, for Greece, and the civil war sputtered out eventually by 1954. But the real issue here I want to point out is that in the Greek civil war and the intervention into Greece, the United States and the Soviet Union were on different sides. And if the United States and Soviet Union were on different sides, there was simply no way the United Nations could play an effective, um, an effective role. So if we want to see proof of this, we then move up in time a little bit uh, and we go into what is supposed to call the Indonesian question. So that's referred to the ongoing occupation, uh, colonial occupation of the Netherlands by, sorry, of Indonesia by, by the Netherlands. The Netherlands mounted two invasions of Indonesia in 1947 and 49, uh, between 47 and 49, sorry, 47 and 48. And the Security Council uh, simply intervened uh, into what the Netherlands insisted on calling police actions. It's a euphemism for war. You don't want to call it a war, so you call it a, a use a domestic term of police action. But, but the Security Council really leaned on uh, the Netherlands to enter into negotiations with the rebels that eventually resulted in an indep independent uh, United States of Indonesia, which then quickly became an independent uh, republic. Now, global opinion was solidly against the Netherlands in this case, and the US and the Soviet Union were on the same side. And um, that's absolutely crucial for, for the Palestine question. Because in the Palestine question, uh, both the U.S. and the Soviet Union, for very different reasons, wound up supporting uh, partition. In fact, the Soviet Union was much more supportive when in May of 1947, famous moment at the U.N., when the um, U.N. ambassador, uh, Andrei Gromyko, announced uh, Soviet support for Zionism and for the creation of a Jewish state, you know, suddenly communists throughout the world literally just stopped in their tracks and I've seen this with newspapers I was reading from the time, you know, communist newspapers that are anti-Zionist one week, the next week, they're completely in favor of the creation of a Jewish state. And this was done largely to discomfort the British Empire uh, and perhaps establish a foothold in the Middle East. This was not because, you know, the Soviets were particularly uh, friendly towards Jews. The American policy was a bit different. Uh, there was a lot of opposition to support for Zionism in the security services, the CIA, in the State Department, the Truman administration, as I think has been you know, exhaustively shown, did demonstrate, though, um, sympathy for, for Zionism and eventually wound up uh, supporting the creation of the State of Israel quite, quite strongly. So the, the Palestine case then is, is more similar to the Indonesian question than the Greek question because of the stance of the superpowers. Now, the UN as a whole, though, it's not just the US and the Soviet Union. As I mentioned at the very beginning, every country sort of gets into the act when it comes to the Palestine question. First of all, there's the UN Special Committee on Palestine, which I'll talk about in just a second. That's 11 people. But then there's the Ad Hoc Committee on the Palestine question, which is basically all of the member states of the UN with subcommittees, and they have to uh, refine 
the recommendations that were made by uh, UNSCOP. And then there's even more committees, the Palestine Commission, which was supposed to implement partition, the Truce Commission, which was supposed to establish a truce, the truces in Palestine once Israel and the Arab states began to fight. And then the Conciliation Commission, which was supposed to make things all better as the war wound down later in 1948. Just think about it. Every committee has members, uh, lots and lots of small states, and everyone, as it were, has their turn um, getting involved in the uh, in the story. But I want to focus for a little bit on this group of uh, of men. And yes, the players in this story today are largely men when I talk about high politics uh, of the time. Uh, the, the the men of 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 UNSCOP. Um, this is a group of people who, in many ways, were quite representative of the UN at the time. And the reason I say that is because UNSCOP has come under a lot of criticism, particularly. I think pro-Palestinian sources will say that this was a group of men who represented Zionist interests, who were sympathetic to Zionism, and it was all kind of a foregone conclusion. And this is just not true. You know, if you read through the protocols of the meetings of UNSCOP, which I have done over the several months they met uh, in 1947, they were kind of all over the map in terms of their views about Palestine. Uh, there were two members of the 11 uh, who were Muslim, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, delegate and the Indian delegate, uh, 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 Mohammed Abdul Rahman. Uh, there were representatives from Latin American countries, which was the single largest bloc in the UN at the time. Remember, most of the world, much of the world is still under colonial control, and they're not yet independent countries in the UN. Uh, and then you have uh, countries like uh, uh, the Netherlands and Australia and Canada, which really um, some representatives, some delegates were sympathetic to Zionism, others weren't. The Peruvian representative, for example, was very concerned about Catholic interests in the Holy Land, and his support for Zionism was uh, was tepid uh, at best. Um, the fact is that the decision to partition Palestine was not made lightly. It's really amazing to read through the protocols of the meetings of this uh, body over a period of several months. They felt they had an impossible situation, that if they were to recommend a unitary Arab state with a Jewish minority, they knew what the result would be, which would be um, tyranny, uh, domination of the Jews by, by, by the Palestinian Arabs. Um, they certainly weren't going to establish a, a Jewish state in all of Palestine, although that was technically uh, what the Zionists asked for, although they privately conceded at a very important private meeting that they would accept partition. So what else was left? Uh, you know, they came up with the idea of partition, of dividing the country. Uh, that wasn't the only idea. There were three delegates, uh, Iran, India, and Yugoslavia, who had a different view. Uh, they had a view of... Um, of um, a kind of federation within a single state. The strongest proponent of that view being Muhammad Abdul Rahman himself. So there he is on my uh, on my left. And then on the other side, a very powerful um, voice in favor of Zionism, the uh, uh, Guatemalan representative Jose Garcia um, Granados. That look, they they were not free from bias. Uh, Jose Garcia Granados himself was something of a philo-Semite and an anti-Semite at the same time, as he said in one in one committee meeting. Uh, he said, Jews are a strong-willed people who are rich and have international connections and that they have some defects in their character. So it's not exactly a ringing endorsement, but he did believe that Jews uh, had done much to establish uh, and to deserve a, um, a state. Uh, so they did disagree quite a bit among themselves. Uh, especially as they got towards the August 31st deadline and they were meeting until 2, 3 in the morning. Tempers flared. Uh, people were carping at each other. I mean, you can imagine the environment. And it really took the effort of the committee chair, very distinguished Swedish jurist, Emil Sandström, who you can see how he leads the committee towards a consensus decision on uh, the majority recommending uh, partition. And the other thing I noticed was so interesting about this is that the committee heard a lot from Jewish sources and Zionist sources. They also had tons of information uh, representing Arab points of view, Palestinian points of view, even though the Palestinians boycotted officially. Uh, the committee, they did speak with Palestinians. They talked a lot with representatives from the churches. They were very well informed. This wasn't uh, 
this wasn't really like the partition of India, which was done rather quickly. And, you know, the so-called Radcliffe line, a man who had never been to India just drew the red line dividing Pakistan from India. This wasn't like this at all. It was, it was extremely um, well-informed. Now, how did, you know, people in the world view this uh, at the time? Well, Arab League states were thrilled about the Indian delegate. And, and India chose a Muslim jurist for a very good reason, because of the substantial Muslim minority, even after partition, uh, there was going to be a, a very large Muslim minority, a fraught relationship with Pakistan, and the need for what the Indian Foreign Office called in a memorandum, a contented Arab world. So for all of these reasons, um, you know, India very much needed to have a pro-Palestinian position. Uh, India very wisely or pragmatically chose another Muslim, Asaf Ali, to be India's representative to the ad hoc committee uh, on Palestine. And to get back to that point about a pan-Islamic view, in the UN, he called himself a representative of not only India, but the Muslims of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Burma, because they don't have representation in the UN. So he claimed to be representing you know, the Ummah, the Islamic uh, um, community as, as a whole. And Ali said very clearly that partition, as had been applied to subcontinent, should not happen in Palestine, because in India, both sides had agreed to partition. And, 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 and they were... And, and the populations were supposed to stay in situ, even though they didn't, and there was massive population movement. And he felt that in Palestine, only one side wanted partition, and that this would lead to a great injustice. As he said, Arabs would never tolerate a what he called an alien body. Uh, what he wanted, and a lot of Indian del uh, diplomats at the time wanted, was a unitary Arab state with some sort of guaranteed rights for the Jewish minority. But it was actually Jawaharlal Nehru, the foreign minister uh, at the time and the head of India's interim government who told Abdul Rahman that we need a federated state rather than a unitary state. He called it a middle course, I'm quoting from his, uh, his uh, memorandum to Abdul Rahman, a middle course between what may be theoretically just and what is factually uh, predictable. So that was the Indian position. The Pakistani position was actually more, I would say, militant. Uh, as led by their delegate, Muhammad uh, Zafrullah Khan. And there was also, um, I think, a very strong anti-Zionist view, but expressed extremely eloquently by the uh, Lebanese um, diplomat uh, Charles Malik. Um, you know, Khan said things that sounded harsh at the time, but in some ways were quite uh, prescient, as he uh, said in um, late 1947. It would be more, I'm quoting him, it would be more honest to recommend the compulsory exchange of population between the two states than to propose leaving almost half a million people, that is, Arabs in a proposed Jewish state, to the mercy of regulations which would eventually force their migration in destitution from the Jewish state into, um, into other neighboring states. I mean, he saw that this was a recipe for, for trouble. Now, what's interesting about the objections to partition that came from Arab diplomats is sometimes... I would say they were logical um, and rational representations of, 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 of a certain point of view, of a certain anti-Zionist point of view. But those objections often got mixed up with uh, mischaracterizations of Jews, Judaism, and Zionism, uh, accusations of Jewish financial power or undue influence over American uh, foreign policy. So... Uh, this mix between, I'd say, a kind of rational objection to Zionism and anti-Semitism was present very early on in 1947 and uh, 1948. And we see this with the, the question about, about lobbying and um, accusations made by Arab states that the American government and that Jewish groups engaged in um, illegitimate pressuring uh, lobbying, threatening, bargaining in order to get states to vote for partition in the famous vote of November 29th, 1947. So what really happened? Uh, well, the General Assembly demanded a two-thirds vote on any kind of substantive issue of policy. And one reason why the whole issue was thrown into the lap of the General Assembly uh, was precisely because the idea at the time that the General Assembly was, the, was, was a world parliament, 
the Security Council could handle important you know, security issues quickly, but it didn't represent that many countries. So the General Assembly, the idea was that you had to have a, a substantial majority of two thirds, you know, the voice of the world before you make a substantive policy decision. And partition of Palestine was certainly was certainly one of them. And it is true that the American administration, you know, already in the spring, summer of 1947, fall of 1947, began lobbying for support for partition even before the vote had been uh, had been taken. And Zionists mobilized as well uh, in the fall of 1947, uh, calling for pro-Christian groups to ally themselves and, you know, to, to um, mobilize popular opinion for the Zionist cause. That is, lobbying certainly occurred. There's no question about it. The question is, did it involve undue pressure? Was it inappropriate? Well, the fact is that um, Arab states were engaging in uh, lobbying too. They were lobbying uh, and threatening Latin American states if they didn't vote for partition. Um, uh, the Arab League states, for example, lobbied the Guatemalan president, and they promised Costa Rica support for a, a place on the Security Council, or sorry, the Trusteeship Council in exchange for a no vote. Uh, the Syrian delegate to the uh, United uh, Nations warned his Greek counterpart that if Greece didn't support the Arabs, Syria would not support Greece in its own plea for world opinion in its uh, civil war. In other words, um, the fact is that both sides, both the Americans and the um, Arab states engaged in uh, in pressure tactics. So for American tactics, it's clear that um, American pressure came upon countries like Cuba, Greece, Haiti, Honduras, Liberia, the Philippines, and, and China. And, and the accusations were laid out very clearly in early 1948 in a very long memorandum written by the celebrated um, American diplomat George Kennan. I don't think George Kennan ever wrote a memorandum that wasn't long. Uh, so these were all private communications, but also the newspapers began to report stories of undue you know, pressure on uh, UN delegates. For example, on uh, February 7, 1948, the Palestinian uh, Arab Higher Committee sent a letter to the UN Secretary General saying that there was unfair pressure on Colombia, Cuba, Haiti, Liberia, Siam, and and so forth. So yes, uh, lobbying and bargaining went on on both, on both sides. The difference really is the Americans were more successful at it. That's all. They were better at it because they had no power, not that they were necessarily less, less virtuous. Um, the fact is that Latin American states who were the largest single bloc at the UN at the time, they made their own choices in 1947. Uh, whatever pressure came upon them, they made their own choices based on their own interests. Uh, Mexico, for example, abstained. Argentina abstained. Uh, the government of Juan Perón in Argentina wanted legitimization from the United States, but Argentina had a large and influential Arab community, so he made his own choice. Uh, Cuba uh, came under a full court press to accept partition, uh, but they said no, they rejected it. Um, Cuba had a delegate to the United Nations who spoke of um, partition as a violation of self-determination. But in fact, uh, the decision by Cuba to reject partition was made by the president of the country, uh, Ramon Grau San Martin, who was angry at the US Congress uh, because they'd passed a sugar act that infringed on Cuban um, sovereignty. Uh, Oswaldo Arana, who, who, the Brazilian delegate who voted for partition, uh, really felt there were no reasonable um, alternatives. And so he voted for partition, although he personally, his own personal preference would have been for a single, um, a single Arab state. Uh, for someone like Garcia Granados of, of Guatemala, supporting partition was in part a rejection of Britain because of British Honduras right next door. Uh, and also a feeling of sympathy for Jews as fellow victims of fascism. There was a lot of feeling in Latin America at the time on men of the left, like Garcia Granados, that the trauma of the Spanish Civil War created kind of a, a penumbra of victims. So Spanish enemies of fascism, Jews, and so forth. So every country really had its own reasons, but the main thing is that countries resisted pressure and, uh, and acted on their own interests. And I want to just focus on what I think is the most interesting part of this, which is um, uh, 
George Kennan insisted that there was a lot of pressure on China by American uh, lobbyists, but particularly by Jewish groups. And he said that, uh, and this is the, the document itself, that uh, pressure had been placed on, quote, our Chinese friends, that they would not receive one penny of American aid if they didn't vote for partition. Kennan said that Jewish groups made these claims. This can't be true. Uh, the United States was, was, was supporting China in its civil war against the communists. Um, uh, George Marshall had tried to get Chiang Kai-shek pleaded with him to improve his human rights record, and Chiang Kai-shek had ignored him, but the United States was still pouring money into, um, into China. And if you actually look at the archives, as I've done, of the nationalist Chinese government, you find a very different story. First of all, there's a lot of sympathy for Zionism going back into the 20s and 30s from the Chinese you know, founding figure of the Chinese Republic, Sun Yat-sen, his wife, then widow, Sun Qingling, and their son, Sun Fo. Now, that doesn't really matter maybe for 1947, 48, but there is a kind of a pattern. But then something much more uh, important happens, which is if you look at internal co uh, correspondence from November of 1947, um, the Chinese diplomats were aware of the difference between some Jewish group, you know, lobbying them to vote for partition and the real power of the American government. And you see this from people like Tsiang Tingfu, who is the chief Chinese delegate to the UN or Liu Gai, or Ku V. Kuyin, also known as Wellington Ku, uh, who was a revered figure in Chinese politics. And at that time, Chinese, uh, China's ambassador to the, uh, to the UN. Um, you know, the fact is that in their correspondence, they say that they're aware of the pressure, uh, but they're the only specific threats, Wellington Ku writes, came from figures on the Jewish side. And they knew there were no direct threats to aid for China. And they did exactly what the Chinese government thought was best, which is they abstained. This was not their fight. And yet the Chinese government was capable of great sympathy for Zionism as one of the UN delegates, Ko Tai Chi, said in early 1948 uh, that the Jewish plight uh, arouses the spontaneous sympathy of peoples throughout the world, and the Jewish people have contributed a great deal, and they deserve a, a, um, uh, a national home. Uh, what's the solution? Well, um, China was very careful, didn't want to, you know, antagonize the, um, oops, didn't want to antagonize the Arab world for, I think, obvious reasons. And so uh, Abba Iban at one point in late 1948 uh, called China the greatest menace for the state of Israel. And yet, in fact, China kept moving back and forth, uh, not heeding pressure from the Americans or from Jewish groups, but following their own interest. So the point of all of this is that national interest, not ideology, not humanitarianism, not anti-Semitism, shaped the diplomatic responses worldwide to the Palestine question. Uh, the Palestine question, though, was of interest to more than elite actors, much more than the Greek question, much more than the Indonesian question, and it penetrated into public opinion. And in the last 15 minutes or so, I want to talk about public opinion worldwide. So this is not just about diplomatic uh, elite actors. The um, fact is that the struggle for Palestine was a public context, and um, uh, people wrote letters. Just amazing. The number of letters that arrived at the United Nations, you know, through the course of 1947 and uh, 1948, uh, telegrams of protest from Jewish groups about, say, the um, refusal of, of, of Britain to allow the, uh, the exodus, uh, the ship known as the exodus to, to, um, uh, to dock in Palestine. Arab groups were incredibly vocal. So if you look through the files of the UN, you see letters and telegrams from Arab societies and organizations in the Middle East, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and virtually every country in Latin America. Uh, just tons and tons of correspondence, but also letters from, from, uh, from people in Britain. Uh, here we have a letter from an angry uh, British non-Jew who writes, you know, uh, this is more than flesh and blood can stand. Get out of Palestine. No more keeping the damned Jews and their like. The outrage is beyond description. So lots and lots of letters, including letters very supportive of Zionism. Uh, the owner of the Mother Goose Kitty Shop in Ellenville, New York, uh, 
wrote to Prime Minister Clement Attlee, God did not delegate England the right to enslave or disperse or destroy any people. Uh, basically, you need to, you know, free, free Palestine. Now, where did people get their opinions? Obviously, they got it from the newspapers. They got it from their faith communities. Um, they got it from um, uh, their friends. And this leads then to the issue of the kind of broader issue of how civil society broadly understood reacted to the war. Well, obviously, a lot of people got their ideas from, from the churches. Now, the Vatican itself had tried to not be explicitly or vocally anti-Zionist during the war of 1948 because they knew the American government was supportive of, 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 of Zionism, and they wanted to work with the American government to help Catholics in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, especially as the Cold War was, was as it were, um, emerging. But in the United States, the post-war Catholic press was quite liberal in its expressions of um, anti-Semitism. Uh, Protestant churches in the Western world, um, in the United Kingdom, and particularly in the United States, tended to be pro-Palestinian, tended to be very solicitous for the Palestinian uh, refugees. For example, the Christian Century, which was a mainstream Protestant journal in the United States, wrote about um, the Palestinian flight as being worse than Lidice. So this was the German massacre in Czechoslovakia during the Second World War. In Lidice, only the men and boys were slaughtered, wrote the Christian Century, as opposed to uh, reference to the massacre at Deir Yassin, where women and children were um, were killed. So this was an issue for Israel that, you know, Catholic and Protestant churches had a lot of influence. And how are they going to deal with this during the war? Uh, church property in Palestine was periodically vandalized or even desecrated by Israeli troops, which led to a lot of anger in the Catholic press. Uh, the Israelis uh, appointed a 30-year-old historian named Yehoshua Prower, who would go on to become an eminent uh, authority on the Crusades. And his job was to be a representative of the Jewish agency dealing with the Catholic Church. And he was amazingly successful. He would go with them to churches where, you know, property had been destroyed or relics or, or um, uh, crucifixes had been defaced. That happened a few times. Uh, and he managed to talk them down. But there were always issues, just one really fascinating one. I came across in the Dutch National Archives a program for a special service for the, for the UNSCOP uh, written by a Palestinian uh, composer and organist uh, known as Augustine Lama. And uh, he was very well known among the Franciscan community where he was raised and lived as the, he was organist at the Holy Sepulcher, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Uh, he was a well-known composer and he got, he, got, he was actually taken captive in June of 1948. And the Italian uh, the consul pleads for his release and, you know, there's a whole kerfuffle and eventually he's he's released. So clearly this is a uh, an issue for um, uh, of global concern. And in the early months of 1948, the Zionist uh, movement through the Jewish agency and through many other offices organized um, hundreds and hundreds of organizations that could lobby for public opinion in virtually every state or colony in the world. There's amazing lists in the Central Zionist archives of Zionist uh, propaganda or information offices in the Belgian Congo, uh, Eritrea, Kenya, uh, every Latin America, uh, American country, uh, the creation of Christian pro-Palestine committees, uh, pro-Zionist books like Pierre von Passen's Jerusalem Calling or Walter Clay Loudermilk's Palestine Land of Promise were translated into, um, into Spanish uh, for distribution to non-Jews throughout Latin America. So a tremendous global Zionist uh, lobbying effort. And a practical example of it comes in Honduras, where Sam Zemere, uh, known as the Banana King because he made a fortune first selling bananas and then basically owning huge swaths of Latin of Central America uh, and its banana plantations. He, and I saw this in the correspondence in the archive, he basically leaned on the main Honduras newspaper to publish only um, articles from the Jewish agency's news, news uh, the Jewish agency's news agency about the Palestine uh, war. Um, 
So clearly, you know, the Zionists are working very hard to influence public opinion, but it didn't necessarily work because in Honduras, for example, there was a large uh, and prosperous Arab community which had its own publications and expressed pro-Palestinian views. And in fact, in Honduras, Argentina, Chile, throughout the Latin American Majar or the Arab diaspora, there were many organizations representing the Arab position to Palestine. Uh, and of course, something similar in North America, in Canada. So here's the Canadian content for Josh Chaplitsky. Uh, there was the Canadian Arab Friendship League, uh, Friendship League founded by Mohamed Saeed Massoud, a uh, Lebanese. And then in the United States, there was a, a much greater amount of public um, uh, Arab, I would say, um, American and Arab lobbying. Uh, the Institute of Arab American Affairs, headquartered in Washington, D.C., which had branches in several cities in the U.S., it lobbied the State Department, it hosted you know, dinners and events in order to, quote, inform the nation about the Palestinian cause. So it was you know, devoted to promoting uh, that side, that perspective. Another organization called the Arab Office, which was under the auspices of the Arab League, um, had a similar purview uh, founded by, among other people, Ahmad Shukeri and uh, Cecil uh, Horani. They placed ads in the New York Times, they published a news bulletin, and so forth. Now, what's also interesting, though, are grassroots Arab American organizations, not just the big elite ones. I found reference to the Syrian and Lebanese American Federation of the Eastern States. They met in Springfield, Massachusetts in October of 1947, and they used the language of the American Declaration of Independence. Um, they produced a petition with a lot of whereas clauses, you know, in the style of the inalienable rights of man. And they channeled the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution that um, – nations, the rights of nations are, are reserved to those member nations. And here we see, you know, them using very, they're using language from the discourse of American democracy to support the Palestinian cause. You know, as citizens of the United States, we call for support uh, for the people of Palestine, uh, you know, and, and to reject autocratic rule by recent alien immigrants inflicted upon the people of Palestine against their against their wishes. Um, by the way, at this confab, which lasted several days, their keynote speaker was Bayard Dodge, Dodge uh, president of the American University in Beirut. Um, and he compared the relationship between Arab states with relationships between the 13 colonies. Uh, he compared Charles Malik, the Lebanese delegate, with Benjamin Franklin, for example. Now, you know, I think this language was instrumental or sincere I mean, Jewish groups always used the language of American democracy as well to defend themselves, uh, to defend their view. And that latter view, the Jewish view, that to be a Zionist was to be a good American, a very old view in the history of Zionism, but that the Zionists were reproducing uh, America on a smaller scale, was very much the part and parcel of the American press of 1947 and 1948 spread by the likes of the politician and editor of the New Republic, uh, Henry Wallace, who uh, claimed that 1948 was another 1776. Uh, Walter Winchell, the famous journalist, wrote of the British, you tried your Palestine policy in America and you got 1776. So clearly um, that idea was quite popular. And um, I've been fascinated by the number of journalists, um, American journalists, who wound up in Palestine in 1947-48, covered the war, uh, produced dispatches, and then wrote books about it. The books are extremely well-informed. And the most famous one is by the British-Hungarian writer Arthur Kessler, who wrote Promise and Fulfillment. But there were a lot of other ones, including this guy, this very good-looking guy, Kenneth Bilby, who covered the war for the New York Herald Tribune and wrote a terrific book about it, which is both, in some ways, it's very celebratory of Israel, he claims that uh, Tel Aviv is, I'm not making this up, quote, the beginning of an Israeli version of New York's Rockefeller Center. Okay, that's a bit, a bit exaggerated. Um, he also is uh, very uh, uh, admiring of, of the kibbutzniks, you know, taming the desert and claiming, uh, you know, reclaiming the land. Um, he claims that Israel displays all the irascible qualities of a brawling Western outpost in America's frontier days. 
but you know, he was also critical. He was critical of Israel's um, uh, pol- uh, basically the forced flight of the Palestinian refugees. He wrote that if Israelis don't solve the refugee problem, they will never know peace. So he was very sympathetic to Israel, very well informed, uh, but also critical. Then there was the, the man on my right, uh, Arthur Darunian, who was a Mar- Mar- Armenian American, uh, had the pen name John Roy Carlson, who actually went undercover and um, as a photographer and was present with Arab forces, Arab volunteer forces in Palestine in 1948. And he was absolutely enraptured by, by Israel for religious reasons. As an Armenian or um, a Christian, as he wrote, in my mind's eye, I found myself substituting Armenian for Hebrew characters in the alphabet. I saw an Armenian democracy. I read Armenian newspapers. I saw Armenia creatively at work. I saw Armenia being rebuilt. Yes, I dreamed. And this is all in response to his, he he was in Israel and he was actually in Jerusalem on on May 15th. And he was very excited by by Israel as he wrote, um, Israel as I saw it represented good, the Arab world represented evil. So again, not very, um, you know, difficult to figure out where he stood. This, this passionate support of Israel was common in other parts of the world. In France, for example, uh, Joseph Kessel, himself Jewish, uh, a celebrated writer. He would later be elected to the, um, to the Académie Française. Um, and he um, very much compared Israel to the Maquis, to the resistant fighters in France during World War II. This was very common in France after World War II to compare Zionists to the Maquis to exaggerate their own role in the resistance. Only 1% of people in France engaged in the resistance, but to basically see in Israel a continuation of the resistance, just as Americans saw in Israel a continuation of you know Valley Forge, that sort of thing. Um, but Kessel was absolutely besotted in, uh, by Israel, and he wrote extensively uh, in his journalistic um, uh, reports from uh, Israel during the heart or the height of the 1948 war. Um, he even compared the uh, Haganah to, to the Foreign Legion and so forth. So he made lots of, you know, lots and lots of comparisons. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated, which I'm going to move towards the end, of a country like Germany, which had perpetrated the Holocaust, and which didn't quite know what to do with Israel. Uh, Some people have said that there was very little treatment of the founding of Israel in 1948. That's just not true. There was a lot of it, Um, but it was often just like news reports without commentary, afraid of saying the wrong thing, Uh, except for this formidable woman, Marian Grafen von Dünhoff, who was a Prussian Junker, uh, who was a, like a, a, a genuine anti-Semite, uh, but an anti-Nazi, right? An old-fashioned conservative. And she became one of the most powerful figures in post-war German journalism and the editor of Die Zeit, uh, the weekly out of Hamburg. She wrote quite openly in 1948 about her distaste for, um, for the state of Israel. She called it a, a, an ethnic state or a, a Volkstadt. Um, you know, she basically said, that well, she compared it in some rather unfavorable ways uh, to Germany of the 1930s. So there was that, but in general, in Germany, uh, there was a lot of reporting about about Israel, uh, sometimes extremely favorable. Uh, Der Spiegel, uh, for example, devoted a huge amount of attention to Israel. In 1948, Israel was covered in 29 issues: 12 for Greece, seven for India five for Indonesia. So there was more coverage of Israel really than any other foreign country. And it was usually quite favorable, although there were also anti-Semitic references to the displaced persons, the Jews in the displaced persons camps in um, in Germany and Austria. So the idea is kind of a continuation of anti-Semitism for those Jews who are on German and Austrian soil. But once they get to Israel, then it's okay. Uh, and that kind of anti-Semitism was, uh, you know, ongoing. It was not dimmed by um, by the war and no reference whatsoever to Nazi crimes, none. So what we see then is, um, you know, unexamined anti-Semitism, unacknowledged guilt. And again, every country, the reportage, the way people, you know, deal with the creation of the state represents their own history, their own interests, their own past. 
I'm just going to finish very briefly by getting out of the Western world and referring as well to an, another couple of examples of national specificity and interest. So there was a seasoned Turkish journalist named Faruk Fenik who covered um, Palestine in 1948 for the newspaper Vatan or, or Homeland. And in some ways, he was very admiring of Israel because of its technical accomplishments, its schools, its buildings and so forth, its scientific laboratories. Although somehow he thought that all the Jews in Palestine came from Germany, which it wasn't, you know, it wasn't quite right. It wasn't quite right. He thought the Jews were far superior to the Arabs. Remember, he's a Turk. Um, but he also it has anti-Semitic ideas. He calls the Jews conceited, manipulative. He says the Jew has money in his pocket, credits in the bank, and he thinks, how can I exploit the others? And yet he favored the creation of a partitioned Palestine. He wrote, 1.2 million Arabs cannot be left to be exploited by the Jews, and 700,000 Jewish intellectuals cannot be doomed to wander forever. Okay, they weren't all intellectuals. But you get the point that even though there's a lot of anti-Semitism there, there's also admiration in a backhanded way for Jewish technological accomplishments and a sense that there must be partition, if only to protect the Palestinians from the Jews, which is a very unusual argument. But where does this come from? Think about where he's coming from as a Turkish writer writing for, well, actually, it was, I think it was Azerbaijani, but anyway, he's writing for a Gamalis newspaper. And this is really classic Gamalism, secular, uh, technophilic, enamored of high modernism, but defensive and suspicious of, of, of the West. And then finally, just to end with India, which we talked about a lot earlier, obviously there was a lot of opposition to partition in the major Indian newspapers. Uh, and yet at the same time, a certain anger at both Jews and Arabs, I'm talking about now some of the more major uh, newspapers connected with the dominant Congress parties, like the T T Congress Party, like the Times of India, that basically sees the Jews and Arabs as victims of selfish and sectional interests. So there, there is sympathy for the Palestinians, but a certain amount of criticism from them. And yet, what's really interesting, however much they opposed partition at the beginning, the general sense by the fall of 1948 was that, and I'm quoting now the Times of India, actual and effective partition has been achieved by Jewish arms. In other words, we have the two states, we have to live with it. And by the way, Chinese diplomats did the same thing in the fall of 1948, uh, cabling uh, Arab states, Israel has been created, they've won the war, deal with it. So this is done privately, China's not going to say that publicly. So just to finish then, this has been a very selective and brief analysis of journalistic sources, but it shows us how distinct forms of historical memory and political culture shape narratives of events external to one's own state. All perspective is, or all perception is perspectival, but in the case of Palestine, the perceived object was viewed through a prism and through a uh, magnifying glass. Um, you know, whether the fighting was seen as a repetition of the British defeat at Lexington or the Maquis stand against the Wehrmacht at Verkur or the mass slaughter of Muslims in Amritsar, Palestine became a floating signifier and its meanings began to extend beyond what I started with, which was its value to Christian and Muslim civilization. That's where we started by, in the 19th century. By the end of the war, Palestine had become a global focal point, and that's what it's remained to this day. And with that, I'll stop. You can come back. Come back. Thank you very much, Professor Penslar, for that wow, sweeping global talk. Thank you for, for placing this important question into all of its wider contexts. Um, we have a good number of questions, but Professor Penslar has agreed to stay on for a bit to uh, oh, yeah. hear and respond to questions. And so I encourage people to continue to submit them into the question and answer box. And I'll try to cluster a few of them together as thematically as I can uh, in great. order to solicit responses. Um, a number of our audience members, and we have a, a very impressive audience today, a number of our audience members have asked questions about refugees. Yeah. Uh, both Jewish and Palestinian. 
Some have asked about the various roles that Jewish refugees and displaced persons in the wake of the Holocaust uh, in various forms of global dispersion played, uh, if at all, in um, lobbying um, or other, other forms of creating um, impacts in their new uh, home or at least temporary home countries. Mm -hmm. um, and another participant asks, on, from something of the opposite perspective and asks, uh, appreciates the partition plan as the product of much international deliberation and also asks if the same was true for the creation of UNRWA, uh, the United Nations Relief Works Organization. Um, was that like or unlike the treatment of other war refugees and to what extent was there global deliberation about this? So a uh, pairing of refugee and displaced persons questions. Great question. So thank you to all of you who wrote them and thank you for, to Josh for his wonderful synthetic powers. Um, so yes, I mean, the DP issue, I'll start with that. So it's one of the great tragedies and ironies of Zionism that in a way, World War II both destroyed and enhanced the argument on behalf of Zionism because the whole purpose of the Zionist enterprise was to provide a safe haven for millions, millions of Eastern European Jews who the thought was early in the war would survive the war, but be, you know, um, impoverished, pauperized, stateless, and we need a place to go. Uh, but World War II killed two thirds of the Jews in Europe. And many of the Jews who were left were in the Soviet Union where they weren't going to be getting out. Uh, so what it came down to really was a few hundred thousand survivors, uh, displaced persons in the refugee camps in Germany and Austria, and Jews in various Central and Eastern European countries who, you know, would perhaps want to, and many of them did, uh, move, to, move to Israel. But the DP issue in and of itself in those German and Austrian refugee camps was absolutely central. It appeared over and over again in the deliberations of UNSCOP, and in fact, there was a fight within UNSCOP as to whether they should visit the DP camps. Because Abdul Rahman said the Palestine issue should have nothing to do with our understanding of the Holocaust, and he didn't use that term, but the DP camps. This is an issue about Jews and Arabs in Palestine and how we can achieve justice for both peoples, although he was thinking primarily about justice for the Palestinians. But and so what happened is there was a split in the committee some of them wound up in the in the DB camps and some of them didn't. Uh, but for those who went, it was extraordinarily uh, meaningful. Uh, so all along, there was a tension within UNSCOP as to whether this issue was one about tensions between Jews and Arabs in the Holy Land, in Eretz Israel, in Palestine, or whether it was also part of a global issue about the DPs and in general, the, the notion of a place for them to call, a place to call home, uh, a place for them to go was very, uh, was very important. Um, you know, they also heard arguments from uh, Palestinian sources that the Jews in the DP camps are just being, you know, manipulated and they really don't want to go to Palestine and, and, and so forth. No, but it was a very important issue um, in their, uh, in their deliberations. Now, the creation of UNRWA, this is interesting. Um, it was actually done very quickly, and it was done without anywhere near the kind of deliberation uh, that uh, went behind the partition, was behind the partition of Palestine. And it was done, it's very funny, you know, I mentioned the Conciliation Commission, that when UNRWA was created, somewhere in a document, I found that it will be given an initial mandate to work for like nine months or 11 months, I forget what it was, by which time this whole problem will have been solved. And I can't see anyone in the audience, but I hope that there's some sardonic smiles uh, because, of course, you know, that didn't happen. So my understanding of UNRWA, I'm not an expert on it, though, from what I saw in the documents, was that it was thrown together fairly quickly. Whoop, where's Josh? There he is. Thank you. You don't have to keep um, disappearing, Josh, you know, I mean, maybe if you want to, you can, but. You're the star of our show. Uh, another another question comes um, regarding federalism and federative structures. Um, this comes from the arguments of Rahman and Nehru. And yeah. our, our questioner asks, do you see any continuities between uh, proposals that were mooted for different forms of federations or federal structures that are being revived in part in our time today? Yeah, that's, I think, the key question. Uh, you know, as I tell my students, and as I hope to write in this book, 
1947 gave us, I think at least, two the two reasonable options or the three reasonable options or possible options because there was the demand for the Arab unitary state, which the you know UNSCOP representatives heard many times from the Arab world, and they just asked themselves, can this possibly be implemented? And the answer was no. And I understand there are people in the world today who think this could be implemented. Uh, but anyway, the other two uh, solutions they came up with, which they really dwelled on, was, again, partition, uh, dividing the land, or um, the federal solution, which is indeed coming back in some ways. So there's this initiative that some people on the Zoom call might know, the, uh, what is it, One Land, Two Peoples initiative, which calls for two states, but they have a, a very close relationship with each other in terms of, you know, residents of one can be citizens of the other and so forth. This federated idea was a bit different in that it would be a single state uh, with these two autonomous zones. And the problem with this proposal really was that it assumed a central government that would have to deal with certain very sensitive issues like defense. And so um, I think this kind of thing might be able to work in a country like Belgium, where you do have a central government and then you have you know a great deal of autonomy to Wallonia and to Flanders. But I'm not sure if that idea could have really worked in in um, in Israel, Palestine. But yes, there's certainly in, just in the fact that we've, we're trying to think of something in between the unitary state on one side, uh, whether it be dominated by Arabs or by Jews, and on the other, uh, um, complete and total partition. So there's this gray area in between, and I think that the uh, that Nehru's idea represents the first iteration of that. And we're seeing fine tuning of that idea now in 2024. Thank you. Uh, we are nearing the end of our time, but we have just a few minutes more, but a number yeah. of questions have come in to ask if there are any broad takeaways that you might want to offer us in thinking about present in light of past. Well, that's easy. The takeaways, at least in my you know grant proposals, the takeaway is that, um, well, first off, it took time for the war in 1948 to become the 1948 war. That is, as I you know I told you today, countries perceived the war very differently in real time. They perceived the Palestine question very differently in real time, largely in terms of national interest and national experience. So it's quite a bricolage. That's what I do in the early part of the book or much of the book. Then towards the end, because I've only, I mean, the, what you saw today was a kind of uh, abstract of two chapters in what's going to be a much longer book. I'm going to take the story through the 1960s and 70s and talk about how that's when the Palestine question became global in a new way, uh, largely now with Palestinians increasingly playing a role in, in writing the narrative. Uh, and that's, for example, in the 70s when the Nakba took on the meaning it has today. When the word Nakba was used by Konstantin Zarek in his pamphlet of 1948 um, uh, on the meaning of catastrophe, he meant the failure of the Arab world to defend itself against the West. And it's actually very weird to me, at least, that in that pamphlet, there's very few references to Palestinians. The meaning of Nakba, however, Nakba was used colloquially among Palestinians at the time to refer to their disaster, although they used other words as well. But it was really only in the 70s because of the change in, again, uh, the global geopolitical climate that the Palestine issue rose to prominence and the word Nakba took on new meaning. And in Israel also, uh, there it took time for the war in 1948 to become seen as this you know, foundational element to the state. And what's really amazing, and I didn't talk about this tonight, but didn't have time to do everything, if you look at the first like high school textbooks written in Israel in 1957, 58, uh, they actually have a fair amount about the reliance, the dependence of Israel on the international community, about how important it was for Israel to receive this uh, gushpanka, you'd say in colloquial Hebrew, this as it were kind of approval from the United Nations, as opposed to what has become in later years, uh, a sense of ridicule of the UN that the UN is meaningless and that we don't care what the international community thinks. It, it, there was definitely much more of an awareness. And surprisingly, around the same time, uh, 
the IDF published a series of books beginning with translations of three Palestinian accounts of the Nakba. And they write in the introduction, you know, you should know about the Palestinian perspective of their catastrophe, Ha'ason, the catastrophe, Nakba. And the same thing, by the way, shows up in the textbook. The Palestinians call it an Ason. And, you know, so there was actually a kind of fluidity of points of view in Israel in the 19, late 40s, 50s, that then hardened over time. So I really think that wars, like all, you know, um, world transformative events, are somewhat liquid or plastic in real time, and then perceptions of them harden, as it were, in the years and decades following. So I think that's very important. Uh, you could say, okay, fine, the Palestine issue still means X, Y, and Z to me today. But from a historical point of view, it doesn't go back to 1948. 1948 is, as it were, um, at the first point on, on, on a vector, and the vector keeps on moving forward. So I think that's a takeaway about the plasticity of historical memory, the plasticity of 1948. Um, and again, the fact that without in any way slighting the tragedies currently going on in Israel-Palestine, that 1948 in Palestine was merely a part of a world in complete and total rupture, you know, between the 1930s to 1948. It's what... Um, Neil Ferguson calls the war of the world, right, from the Balkan Wars of 1912 until the end of the Korean War, in which scores of millions, hundreds of millions of people die. I think what I'm trying to do is throw light on another reason or another way of understanding how and why the Palestine question became so central. It's not just because of Christianity and Islam, right? There are other reasons that help make this issue absolutely central to global public opinion, which it is. Uh, in our own era, and it has been for many decades. So I think the book is trying to flesh out not just what happened or how people perceived 1948, but the formation of memory and understanding of that war um, and the prominence of that war uh, in our historical memory and our, in our contemporary political opinions really up to this day. Um, I think I speak for many of the attendees today in saying that I personally uh, and we collectively can't wait to see the fruits of this research and the rest of the book. Um, the number of people who have asked to see uh, recordings of this talk in the future, I think, is a testimony to uh, how excited and engaged and how deeply detailed and learned um, your talk was for us today. So it stands only for me to thank you and to thank our audience um, and to uh, wish you all of the best. Thank you for this wonderful contribution to our scholarship. Well, thank you. It was a, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person and uh, hope to get down there in person for something else at this time. At some time soon. As soon as we can. Okay, soon thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.